Exodus the 33rd chapter the first verse through the 17th verse and the Lord said unto Moses depart and go hence thou and the people which thou have brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob saying unto thee thy seed will I give it and I will send an angel before thee and I will drive out the Canaanite the Amorite the Hittite the Perizzite the Hivite and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey for I will not go up in the midst of thee for thou art a stiff necked people lest I consume thee in the way and when they heard these evil tidings they mourned no man did put on his ornaments for the Lord said unto Moses say unto the children of Israel ye are stiff necked people I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee therefore now put off the ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee and the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments in Mount Horeb and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp afar from the camp and called the tabernacle of the congregation and it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which is without the camp and it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at the tent door looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle and it came to pass that Moses entered the tabernacle a cloudy pillar descending and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with the Moses and the, all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in the tent door and the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend and turned again unto the camp but his servant Joshua the son of Nun a young man departed not out of the tabernacle and Moses said unto the Lord see thou says unto me bring up this people and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me yet thou hast said I know thee by name and thou hast found grace in my sight now therefore I pray thee if I have found grace in thy sight show me now thy way that I may know thee that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thou presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here? And I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, and, and I and the people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I am known, I know thee by thy name. I've read several verses today, unusually long, but I want to get you to get the impact. Now get the notes because I have a lot of technical notes involved in this today so that you can go and read the specific dynamics of God's instructions to Moses about the tabernacle. Uh, there are a lot of great notes. You don't get them off the website, get them off the app, get them off the Facebook um, live, wherever you need to get them, download them so you can do the research and see the specific technical aspects of how the tabernacle was constructed. I think you'll find these notes inform uh, informative and educational and you'll get a lot of good information out of that. I'm not going to deal with the technical aspects of the tabernacle today because I won't have the time and there's a lot of uh, work that has to go into it and it takes a lot of time to do that. But I will speak on the importance and the critical aspect of the tabernacle under construction. I started off talking about earlier this year that the tabernacle is the centerpiece of worship. Uh, that the tribes of Israel, as they began to get organized, God gave Moses instructions about how the tabernacle should be built, what materials the tabernacle should be built, uh, should be built from, and that this place called the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies would be the very core 
of the worship experience from uh, the Israelites to God. That once a year, God himself would come down and receive the sacrifice given by the high priest and that God would sit on that mercy seat and receive the sacrifice and forgive the sins of the people of God based on the blood that was placed on the mercy seat in the holy of holies. This was a once a year uh, occasion. It was a very solemn occasion and it was a very sacred occasion wherein God would be forgive his people for their sins. We know that all of the tribes of Israel were arranged around this tabernacle so that they would know that God is the center of the community, that the most important element of their life as a community had to be centered around the core focus of their worship to God. And so I told you before that God uses physical things for physical people so that we are reminded so that our conscience and our mind stays focused on the fact that we need to stay connected to God through our worship. This is why, again, organized religion is important because we need a place. We need a physical, geographical place that we can identify uh, ourselves and be acquainted with God through our practices and through our worship. You cannot eliminate the tabernacle. You will never become spiritual enough to eliminate the church. You will never become spiritual enough to say, I don't need uh, the, the fellowship of the community of God, which centers around the church. In the New Testament, we talked about not only do we center around the tabernacle, but we center around the Lord's table. We understand the significance of gathering in communion around the Lord's table, partaking in the bread, which is physical, but represents a spiritual body of Christ. Also, the, the juice or what we call the wine that represents the blood of Jesus. It is significantly important that we understand that God has established his church and those uh, very sacred moments for us to come together and remember the sacrifice that uh, God made through his son to save us, that we come around that table and we worship. Baptism is another one. There are many uh, 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 practices that the church has been introduced to in the New Testament. Now, they're not as uh, significant or tedious as the Old Testament. A lot of what was um, important in the worship experience of the Jews in the tabernacle of the wilderness uh, are not that critical to our worship today, but there are some elements extended from the Old Testament to the New Testament that we must be included in our worship and our practices as believer. Now, when you try to eliminate the house of God, when you try to eliminate the table of communion, and when you try to eliminate baptism, when you try to eliminate the sacred elements of our worship, then that is the, the foundation. Now you have no foundation upon which to build your faith. So while we are enjoying social media, we are enjoying the benefit of getting up, put on our clothes and watching from home in the convenience of our home. Don't you make the mistake of thinking that is a substitute for the coming together of God's people in worship and in fellowship and working and doing those things that are necessary in the kingdom of God. Don't you get it confused. Thank God for social media. Thank God for the opportunity to stream in. Thank God that when you're sick, crippled, you know, you can't get to church, you have another avenue to be in the service. But that does not substitute for your physical attendance to the house of God, for your physical cooperation and practice in God's community, and partaking in those sacred elements, um, baptism, communion, and other things that have been established in the kingdom of God for our worship. Now, I thought I had to get that off my chest real quick before we don't get it twisted. Uh, uh, we have to 
be engaged in soul, spirit, and mind. Uh, you can't just be engaged with God in your spirit. All you that's got the spirit and it's all about the spirit, well, don't forget, if you were a spirit, you wouldn't be here. You're in a body. So you need to take your temple and bring it to the temple. And give God the praise and worship and glory when this is all right for us to come together. Don't get it twisted. I know my Bible and, uh, and, and you need to understand uh, that we, it is very critical and important. When you erode the necessity of the church, when you erode the sacraments of the church, then you erode your relationship with the church and the community begins to erode. That's why we got all these problems we got now because we have left the church. Now, uh, you can argue all you want to, do what you want to do, but at the end of the day, this is God's church. So here in this text, we see that uh, God is frustrated with his people as it's been made known to Moses. His, his frustration with the people's attitude. Uh, his frustration with the, the people always challenging the authority of the leader and God's purpose for them. The fact that God is trying to liberate them and take them to a land, as we read in the text, that flows with milk and honey. And they are continuously rebelling and fighting and uh, 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 in unbelief and uh, uh, ch chatting against Moses, murmuring and complaining has now brought God to a sense of frustration. Now, even God is getting tired. Now, when you make God tired, He's long-suffering. He teaches us to be long-suffering. But every one of us know enough is enough. God is at the point with these people that he has had enough. He just experienced giving Moses the laws of the Ten Commandments and they're down at the foot of the mountain having an orgy. They done made a golden calf out of jewelry and when Moses asked Joshua, uh, Aaron how did this calf uh, come about, Aaron lied. He's the high priest. He lied and said they just threw the jewelry into the fire and a calf jumped out. They were down there committing orgies, naked and ruthless and wild. Why? Because man without leadership is going to have a problem and, and has no structure and there's no peace and there's no order. This is what you get uh, because people start turning back to their old sinful and carnal nature on steroids. These people are going crazy down there and Moses was only gone 40 days. Uh, they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't stay in uh, worship and stay in the right attitude for 40 days they jet they were jacked up in 40 days they they backslid in 40 days they they walked away from God in 40 days and, and so God says I'm I'm frustrated with these people he says tell them that just Drop, don't put no jewelry on it. Just, just strip themselves of their jewelry. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going into the promised land with you. I'm so sick of y'all. I'm not even going with you. I'm going to send some angels, but I ain't going to be with you. He says, uh, I'm taking you into a land of milk and honey. But when you go into this land of milk and honey, he said, I will not, verse 3, go up into the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. You better hear me this morning. He says, because you're my people don't mean you get a pass. Now, now, because you name the name of Jesus and because you're my people and because I have a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and because you are the apple of my eye, don't get it twisted. He says you are a stiff-necked people. He says you are hard-headed people. He says you are a rebellious 
people. And so God is ready to deal with them. God says, I am fed up. Anytime you can take an eternal God of love and make him fed up, you have got on God's last nerve. These people has gotten on God's last nerve. I think a lot of us don't understand. We have gotten on God's last nerve. We have taken his grace for granted. We have played the role of the harlot. We have went out the other gods we have uh, we have turned ourselves over to our own lust recreation doing our own thing being independent we have made up new religions and decided we're going to follow our own religion that we made up god says i am sick of these people yeah they're my people but i'm sick of them yeah they're my people i made a covenant with abraham but i'm tired because they have gotten on my last nerve how do you get on god's last nerve he's full of love grace and mercy how do you make god mad uh, God made the animals, they obeyed God. He made the plants, they obeyed God. But when God made man, he'd been scratching his head ever since. He repented that he made man in the days of Noah. He repents again to Moses. He is talking to Moses like, man, I'm tired. I'm going to leave these people alone. I'm going to leave them to their own devices. God calls the people a stiff-necked people who are the most rebellious against the covenant and the plan of God. In this case, God threatens not to be with Israel as they move into the promised land. God is threatening the worst punishment of Israel when he says, I will abandon and leave you to yourself. Listen, listen, God, when, when, what we don't understand, as long as God is dealing with us, even when he deals with us in the way of chastisement, it it means that God is still with us even when he has to deal with us uh, the way he deals with us because of our attitudes and our misbehavior it is a wonderful thing to know that God is there with us the worst thing that can happen listen to me closely this morning the worst thing that can happen to us in our lifetime is that if God abandons us and leaves us to ourselves it is amazing that so many of us have abandoned the foundation we have abandoned our faith we have abandoned God's church we have abandoned God's sacraments we have abandoned our worship and and guess what if if you think that you are hurting God by abandoning him, just wait till he abandons you. I, I, I'm sad because we, the worst thing that God can do is let us go. The worst thing God can do is leave us to our own devices and let us do what we think we're grown enough to do. Uh, although Moses is frustrated with the actions and the behavior of God's people, he stands before God as an advocate on behalf of the people. I, I'm just amazed at Moses because now Moses is, it, yeah, he had been mad, he, he broke the commandments, but now Moses done got himself together. Now God got, Moses got to get God straight. Uh, yeah, Mo, now, now, now Moses, God had to get Moses straight straight because Moses broke the commandments out of his anger because they was having an orgy at the bottom of the mountain and but after uh, Moses calmed down now God is angry now Moses got to talk to God listen he says Moses begins to argue or, or allow or talk to God on behalf of the people. I, I don't know if I could have done it. Let me tell you something. You got to be a terrible man to let these people drive you to suicide. Make, let these people uh, betray you and want to stone you and, and kill you and argue against you and complain and get on your last nerve. But yet in the midst of all of that, Moses is willing to stand up and advocate on behalf of God's people. 
people. Moses then is allowed to negotiate and argue with God based on his relationship with God and the idea that God would consider based on his relationship with Moses and his own reputation. In other words, Moses has the privilege. The Bible says as, as Moses was as a friend to God. I'm glad I'm a friend of God. Not only am I glad I'm a friend of God, I'm glad I'm a son of God. And, and guess what? I'm glad that I'm a, uh, I'm a king and a priest in the kingdom of God. Just like those of you that have been born again and washed in his blood. Do not take it for granted your position in God because when you have a relationship with God God will hear your prayer when you have a relationship with God God will change his attitude towards you and the people that are connected to you and so you have to understand that Moses begins to negotiate and argue with God based on his relationship with God and the idea that God would reconsider based on his relationship relationship with Moses and that's amazing because God every now and then uh, uh, he is moved when his people will stand in the gap on behalf of even the craziest people and so Moses stands in the gap and Abraham was going to do the same thing as he went to God and said if you can find five if I can find five righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah would you save the city and God says I love them so much and I hate to see them be destroyed that if you could find five righteous people uh, that, that I will heal the land or I will abstain from my anger. And I got good news for those of us that are holding on, those of us that in the midst of it, we're still standing true to our faith. I got good news with you. You got power with God. You got to understand that your voice, when it is heard, moves God. When he would have destroyed people, when people would have been uh, in their grave and dead because God's relationship with you and he heard your cries they are still in the land of the living and God is honoring your prayers I want to encourage you today don't stop praying don't stop worshiping don't stop standing on the word of God because God is listening to you listen he listens to the cries of his people he listens to the voice of his people and every time you lift your voice to call out to God don't you let the enemy make you think that things are not happening and God is not moving. I want you to know that God will move by the cries of people who really love him and are called according to his purpose. I don't care how much hell is going on. I don't care how much COVID is going on. I don't care how much racism is going on. Let me tell you something. The God we serve know how to handle every racist. Just like he know how to expose you, he know how to get rid of you. You can't hide behind a Bible. You can't hide behind a pulpit. You may think that you're fooling people, but those of you with racist attitudes and bigot attitudes that are holding God's word and think that you're going to get away with it, guess what? The true church is still in the earth. And guess what? You ain't going to get nowhere uh, running around with your hatred, especially you people that are saying that you are children of God who support this hatred, who use this bigotry and try to promote it in the name of the moral character of America. You cannot be a moral politician. You cannot be a moral pastor. You cannot be a moral prophet and stand with people who are racist and bigots. You're talking about people committing abortion but you hanging people. You're talking about people who are doing this and that but you are hateful and you are disguising yourself behind a robe and a Bible. But I got news for you there's somebody that's going to cry loud and spare not and call you out because God is not going to honor your hatred your bigotry and guess what at the end of the day God ain't for evangelicals God is not for Pentecostals God is for the righteous 
Nothing but the righteous are going to stand. And guess what? This is time for righteous people to stand up. This is time for righteous people to pray. This is time for the righteous who love God, who know that God of their salvation to stand up and be counted. And guess what? I don't care what they say. You can sell your soul if you want to. You can go at the political agendas if you want to. But the truth of the matter is, ain't none of them right, but God is still a righteous judge. God is still in control. And God know your address. You sit there behind these poor pits talking about uh, the forefathers of America and how they built the, 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 the nation on uh, godliness. You can't be godly and destroy Indians. You can't be a godly and, and stand up in your pulpit and condone slavery. You can't, you can't be godly and stop, sit in your pulpit and tell other people about living morally right and you got hatred in your heart and slaves in your field. You, you can't be righteous. I don't care who you are. Ain't nobody falling for that foolishness. You can't be righteous. Sitting up in the pool pit talking about don't steal and you don't stole people from their motherland. You talking about you righteous. The four, what about the forefathers? Until they repent for the mess they did, until America repents for the mess it's doing, guess what? We gonna all have trouble with God. At the end of the day, you can't stand up here and tell me this nation was built on the word of God because the word of God has never supported racism in, on any color. Okay, what your name is. So you got a robe on Sunday and a Ku Klux Klan robe in the closet trying to preach out the Bible. You got to understand that God honors his covenant. God honors his word. So Moses, let me get back here because I got a little off. Uh, Moses is able to communicate and negotiate with God based on his personal relationship with God. Based on his own reputation, it is clear that God honors his covenant above his feelings and his attitude about Israel's rebellion. In other words, God ain't going to protect you because you walk carrying around walking a, uh, with a Bible. God ain't going to protect you because you run around talking about you of a certain sect. In other words, God was ready to destroy and move away from his own people because of their rebelliousness. God said, you may think you're the apple of my eye, but I will leave you and let you fend for yourself. Exodus 33, 11, listen to what he says. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh to a friend, and he turned again into the camp. But the, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, departed not out of the tabernacle and Moses said unto the Lord see thou says unto me bring up this people and thou hast not let me know whom thou will send with me yet thou hast said I know thee by name and thou hast also found grace in my sight once again God shows us that his grace is not just a factor of the New Testament but he has always been a God of grace I don't care. Even under the law, you got to see God's grace. Even under the law, you got to see God's mercy. Even under the law, you got to see God's love, that God's anger is tempered by his love. This is why the institution of the tabernacle has such preeminence in our relationship with God. It reminds us that God is with us. It gives us a chance to connect with him through worship with the tabernacle at the center of the community. Any attempt to destroy the practice of having a place of worship is an attempt to minimize the need for a relationship with God. Many times people can find many reasons to find fault in the physical aspects of the tabernacle and worship. God could find reasons to justify removing us from the face of this earth. But just as he did in the days of Noah, once again we see God is not a respecter of person, but his anger is kindled against those who fail to honor and recognize him as God of creation. Listen, you can't hide behind the cross 
with bigotry in your heart. You can, you can wear the biggest cross, get a cross and put it on your back. But if bigotry and hatred and, and racism is in your heart, guess what? You can't hide under no robe. You can't hide behind no Bible. You can't hide behind no office. You can't hide behind a badge. Your badge can't save you from God's wrath. Most realize, Moses realized the tragedy of life without the presence of God. He understood that without God, there is no life and no purpose in the land of milk and honey. Some of us, we are so busy trying to get to the land of milk and honey, but we forgot the land of milk and honey is not going to be good for long. The honey going to run out and the milk going to sour when God is not in the midst. Listen, sometimes we're so busy trying to get to a land of milk and honey we forget that we need God to be with us when we get there it is clear that Moses knew the tragedy of trying to live this life without the presence of God and I feel bad for us because many of us have been deceived in thinking you're going to have real success without the presence of God you can listen we think that this country is going to have success without the presence of God God, we think that we can be great without the presence of God. We're going to make America great again without the presence of God. You done lost your cotton picking mind. Without God, we can't do nothing. And without God's grace and love and mercy, we're going to fail. And guess what? It won't be God's fault because guess what? When you leave him, one day he will leave you and he will laugh at your calamities. He will laugh at your failure he will laugh at the fall of a country that stands up in pride and boasts in its arrogance that it is better than any other country because it has resources and finances and built its wealth on the back of other people who they suppressed oppressed beat chained raped and killed guess what God is not going to forget what a man so he's going to reap and guess what the day of reaping is coming to America we're going to reap what we sowed unless we turn our hearts back to God somebody got to stand in the gap and say God have mercy on this nation we have failed you miserably we have failed to live upright we have failed to live with integrity we have failed to honor our God and to worship our God and guess what we need God's mercy if there's ever a time America needed the grace of God it is today I, I'm telling you we need God's grace we need God's mercy we need God's favor on our lives because I am afraid if God give us what we are justly uh, rewarded with we won't be here very long I'm thankful that the grace of God and the mercy of God is greater than the deviant behavior of man I am thankful that the grace of God the love of God still surpasses our understanding when we should have been cut off when we should have been destroyed his mercy and grace said no and every time you think about Jesus that turns away the wrath of God from a nation you ought to be thankful you ought to be grateful that God does not give us what we deserve it is clear that Moses knew the tragedy of trying to live this life without the presence of God. David was a man after God's own heart. He realized the tragedy of not having God's presence as king. In Psalms 51 9, David cries out and says, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. He said, cast nothing away not me, not, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me you are listen you afraid of losing a job you ought to be afraid of losing God's presence you afraid of losing some friends you ought to be afraid to lose God's presence you hanging out with friends that you know they not right you know they don't have they full of hatred and you're standing behind that listen you better let them friends go and say take not thy spirit from me oh God and 
renew the right spirit in me. Take not from me thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore us unto me the joy of salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now America does not need a new constitution. We need God in our midst. We need to be afraid that God will turn his back on us. We need to be afraid that God will put Ichabod on the door of uh, America we need to be afraid that God will turn his back on us and without God we'll find ourselves in a most miserable place I don't know about you but I need his presence I, I depend on his presence without God we can't do nothing without God an American flag don't mean nothing you can have all the nuclear weapons you can have all the power you can have all the money but if you ain't got God you're just going to sell destruct and be destroyed America has to be honest and we have to get back to God we got to return to the tabernacle we got to turn return to worship God in spirit and in truth and we got to be more concerned about losing the presence of God than we are losing people to support our business Oh yeah, a lot of y'all just want to call your business together. So now black lives matter. No, God see behind your uh, motives. He see what's really going on. And instead of you worried about losing business, you ought to be worried about losing your soul. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and then turn around and lose his soul? The Bible teaches us we are not to fear man, but we are to fear him that can take both our soul and our body. We are to be afraid that God is angry with us. We are to be afraid that God might be on the verge of doing the same thing he was getting ready to do to Israel, and that is remove his presence. Paul writes in Romans declaring that it is not God who has turned his back on us and walked away. It was us who are guilty of dismissing. God from our lives and rejecting his love listen God didn't leave us we left God don't ask me where God is God is everywhere all the time uh, don't ask me what happened to God God has been with us even in the worst times of our situation don't ever question that God is omniscient he's omnipresent uh, he knows all he's everywhere at the same time David said if I make my bed in in hell he is there there is no place I can go where the presence of God is not available to me but we got to understand Paul says you got it wrong God didn't leave you you left God and let me tell you something if God ever take his hand off your life he is not the one that left first and let me tell you something God will divorce you y'all don't want to hear me he, he doesn't want to divorce you he doesn't want to leave you but God gets to the place himself where well, enough is enough where well, I don't believe that bishop where well, you better believe it is say he turned them over to a reprobate mind he turned them over to their own uh, naivety and their own contempt and their own lust and their own desire God will only call on you and warn you for so long God will only come after you for so long and there comes a time where God will turn you over to your own self my prayer today is that God God, please don't let America go. Please don't turn your back on us. Please uh, have grace and mercy. I know we got bigots. I know we full of hatred. I know we got problems. But God, please don't take your presence from us. We need your presence. We can't do nothing without you. We can't live without you. We can't prosper without you. We can't do nothing without you. Every breath we breathe, we breathe it because you put it in our lungs and God our praise is an extension of our worship our worship is an extension of our breath and he everything that have breath ought to be praised in the Lord hey we can walk the streets but there needs to be a praise in the city we can carry our signs but we gotta let the praise and the worship and the honor of God return you can march down the street all you want to you can say black lives matters but somebody need to say Jesus still saves from the utmost Jesus saves he'll pick you up and turn you around he'll put 
your feet on solid ground. God is still in control and we got to turn back to God. Paul says it like this. Because in Romans 1.21 he says, Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, uh, they became fools. Oh my God, we, we think we're smart, but look at the fools we got in the White House. Look at the fools we got all over this country that are leading this country. You can't be wise without God. You can't get it done without God. And because uh, they professed themselves to know it all, they became fools. And they changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image like those made of corruptible men and two birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up oh you want to be oh you got this right don't ever let God give you up he said and God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts this dishonor their own bodies between themselves they changed the truth of God to a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. You know what our problem is? We have served the creature more than the creator. You serve the beach more than the creator. You serve food more than the creator. You serve shopping more than you serve the creator. You serve your car, your money, your bank account, your wealth, your celebrity status more than the living God. He says... They serve the creature more than the creator who blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which it was against nature. He says, y'all got it all wrong. All this anger you got, all this hatred on both sides. All this bitterness you got comes because you didn't have a relationship with God in the first place. Now God have left you to your confusion. You know what? When you leave God, God will let you do your thing until you self-destruct. He will leave you to your foolishness. He will leave you to your, oh, you smart. See, we got a lot of smart people. Let me say something too. We got a lot of smart, black, educated people. You got money now, you think you're smart, you got your degrees. When you was poor, you prayed. When you, didn't, when, you, when you was eating fat back, you stayed in the house of God. Now you done got a little jewelry and you can shop in some places where now you trying, you know, you've been shopping in them places. Now you're mad because you found out they was racist. I bet you ain't going to get them pocketbooks and shoes back. Uh-huh. You ain't that mad, is you? I know. <laughs> yeah, this thing is real. And see, a lot of you playing games and you think that you have gotten above yourself and you think that you got it all in control. And God says, okay, y'all don't want me. Y'all don't turn your back on me. Go ahead and kill each other. Go ahead. See, see how you can make it without me. See, see, see what you're going to do without honoring me first. See, see how you're going to make it. Uh, figure it out. See, you, you, you got all the answers. Uh, figure it out. And so people have sold their soul to get certain people on a bench on the Supreme Court. You have tried to make a moral issue out of a politician. You think, oh, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, all of them full of hell. At the end of the day, all of them got mess. And if you are thinking that one political party is going to be your savior and you don't put your trust in a, a political party, you have lost your cotton-picking mind. The only person 
that's going to be able to move and do in us what needs to be done is the God of our salvation. If you read this Bible, every wicked king that heard the prophet and every king that listened to the word of the Lord had God's grace and favor on them. And everyone that said, I'm going to rule and I'm going to do what I want to do, found themselves in a most miserable situation. Ask King Nebuchadnezzar. He was sitting on his throne, ruling, throwing people in fire, throwing people in the, den, in, in the lion's den. Oh, he just had so much power. But people of God, don't forget, everything is in God's hand. He holds the whole world in his hand. Nebuchadnezzar was in his hand. Trump is in his hand. Everybody you're afraid of, the police officers are in his hand. And one day God said, I'm sick of you. Oh, you think you're running things, right? He was sitting on the throne and lost his mind. Yeah. All God got to do is snatch that little pea brain of yours right out your head and you'll be, wa- you'll be wandering around, don't even know who you are. He was crawling around in his backyard, didn't know who he was like an animal. And when God had mercy upon him and restored his right mind, he said, let me tell y'all something. There ain't no other God but the God of Israel. That, uh, there ain't no other God. I, I, I learned my lesson. And guess what? God is going to teach these people a lesson. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's already started. He's going to teach them that without God's presence, you are done. Your money is done. Everything you got is done. But with God, all things are possible. I want to encourage those of you, especially, I know, I know, We're hurt. I know we're angry. We got a right to be. Nobody is going to sit there and agree with injustices. But at the same time, here's what you can do. Make sure you're in right relationship with God. Because your bitterness and anger is going to do nothing but cause you to self-destruct and lose your soul. Be mad on, but what, what good is it being mad on your way to hell? What good is it being upset on your way to hell? You, you need to get right with God. And when we get right with God, everything else will take care of itself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things that you're worried about right now shall be added unto you. Now I know some of y'all are not going to believe me and that's your right. Just keep on living. Keep on doing what you want to do. Just do your thing. I'm, I'm with you. One thing you're going to find out about me, and I'm going to say this and I'm getting, getting ready to pray because I'm going to get in trouble uh, in a minute. But one thing you need to understand, I'm not going to sit up here and preach against people who are doing what they want to do. If you make choices, live with them. You know what God is? God is a God of pro-choice. He lets you choose the life you want to live and the decisions you want to make. And he also allows you to deal with the consequences. Yeah, yeah, do. Yeah. Just understand this. When you make decisions to be hateful, when you make decisions to do the things you do and you reject God, you know, call on him. I hope he show up. And because he's the God of mercy and reigns on the just as well as the unjust, sometimes he will. But make no mistake about it. When you turn your back on God, God has the right to turn his back on you. So now listen to me. If you are listening to me today and you are bitter and you are, have hate in your heart and bigotry in your heart, let every man examine himself and ask 
the God of your salvation to help you and to forgive you. Love those that despitefully use you. Love those that do you wrong. Don't mean you got to agree with them. Don't mean you got to like them, like what they do. But at the end of the day, you can only control your attitude, your position, and what you are willing to do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is your opportunity to get Christ into your life. This is your opportunity to turn and say, I have a responsibility. I can't, I can't help it that other people hate and walk in bigotry and all of that, but Lord, help me. Restore the right spirit in me. Take not thy presence from me. Help me and give me the grace to do that thing that will place your favor in my life. So if you you listening to me this morning and you have allowed what is going on in this world to affect your relationship with God, I want you to know the worst thing you can do is walk away from God. If you will come to God, God will come to you. God is waiting and ready and able today to touch your life, to heal you, to bless you. The enemy wants you to think that God is like people, but God is not like man. Whosoever will, let him come. If you're here today listening to me, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to receive Christ as your personal Savior. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again. And I ask you, Jesus, come into my Help me to love. Take out this bitterness. Help me to get rid of this hate. Help me to release all of this toxic that's in me. And help me to live a life that pleases you. Thank you, Father, for coming into my heart coming into my life if you have prayed that prayer with me let us know online that you prayed that prayer praying for you Father I pray in Jesus name we can't control what other people do we can't control other people's attitudes and behaviors but we can control ours help us love through us give us grace to give grace give us mercy so we can give mercy Give us forgiveness so that we can extend forgiveness to others. And help us, Lord. This nation is in trouble. But God, help those in leadership all over this country. We pray for leaders who are grappling with their decision to come against a life of racism and to come to grips with the fact that you love everybody the same. I pray for those that are in the president's residence. Lord, I'm not even going to call it the White House. It's a residence. I pray, God, that you would move on Capitol Hill, that you would prove to senators, congressmen, governors, mayors, police unions, police officers, police chiefs, all of those that have abused the power that you gave them and misused their authority to hurt and bring destruction to people unwarrantedly. I pray that you move in our prison system, that you would move prison reform on another level, God, that you would, Lord, make things right, make every low place high, make every high place level, Lord, that we may walk the paths of righteousness, that we may see the glory of God, that we may see a renaissance of your presence and your power in America. We need you today. Help us not to be prideful, but help us to be humble. Help us to walk godly and humbly before you and serve you with a clean and a pure heart and clean hands. Father, we thank you for your love and thank you that you have not destroyed this country already. Thank you that your mercy keeps us intact every day. 
We thank you for your grace. Help us to remember the tabernacle. Remember the house of God in Jesus' name. We love you for it. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Until next time, this is Bishop Hawkins saying, stay prayerful, stay committed. God is in control. Everything is going to be all right. We'll